village on this Oregon. A mean pickers encampment. Here, Maine recalled village life and escaped the confinements of California cities. 5. Open Tickets, Oregon. In the middle of nowhere, the official slogan of an aspiring Matsutake town in Finland. One cold October night in the late 1990s, three Hmong American Matsutake pickers huddled in their tents. Shivering, they brought their gas cooking stove inside to provide a little warmth. They went to sleep with the stove on. They went out. The next morning, all three were dead, asphyxiated by the fumes. Their deaths left the campground vulnerable, haunted by their ghosts. The ghosts can paralyze you, taking away your ability to move or speak. The Hmong pickers moved away, and the others soon moved too. The U.S. Forest Service did not know about the ghosts. They wanted to rationalize the pickers' as camping area, to make it accessible to police and emergency services, and easier for campground hosts to enforce rules and fees. In the early 1990s, Southeast Asian pickers had camped where they pleased. Like everyone else who visits the national forests, but whites complained that Southeast Asians left too much litter. The Forest Service responded by shunning, shunting the pickers to a lonely access road. At the time of the deaths, the pickers were camped all along the road. But soon afterward, the Forest Service built a gray grid with numbered camping spaces, scattered portable toilets, and after many complaints, a large tank of water at the rather distant campground entrance. The campsites had no amenities, but the pickers, escaping from the ghosts, quickly made them of their own, mimicking the structure of the refugee camps in Thailand, where many had spent more than a decade. They segregated themselves into ethnic groups, on one end, Mien, and then those Hmong willing to stay, half a mile away, Lao, and then Mer, in an isolated hollow way back in a few whites. The Southeast Asians built structures of slim pine poles and tarps and put their tents <coughs> inside, sometimes with the addition of wood stoves. As in rural Southeast Asia, possessions were hung from the rafters, and an enclosure gave privacy for dip baths. In the center of the camp, a big tent sold hot bowls of pho. Eating the food, listening to the music, and observing the material culture, I thought I was in the hills of Southeast Asia, not the forests of Oregon. The Forest Service's idea about emergency access did not work out as it imagined. A few years later, <clears throat> someone called emergency services in behalf of a critically wounded picker. Regulations aimed only at the mushroom camp required the ambulance to wait for police escort before entering. The ambulance waited for hours. When the police finally showed up, the man was dead. Emergency access had not been limited by terrain, but by discrimination. This man, too, left a dangerous ghost, and no one slept near his campsite except Oscar, the white man and one of the few local residents, to seek out East Southeast Asians who did it once, drunk on a dare. Oscar's success in getting through the night led him to try picking mushrooms on a nearby mountain, sacred to local Native Americans and the home of their ghosts. But the Southeast Asians I knew stayed away from that mountain. They knew about ghosts. Oregon Center of Matsutake Commerce in the first decade of the 21st century is a place not marked on any map, in the middle of nowhere. Everyone in the trade knew where it was, but it wasn't a town or a recreation site. It was officially invisible. Buyers had established a cluster of tents along the highway, and every evening pickers, buyers, and field agents gathered there, turning it into a theater of lively suspense and action, because the place is self-consciously off the map. I decided to make up a name to protect people's privacy and to add some characters from the up-and-coming Matsutake trading spot down the road. My composite field site is Open Ticket, Oregon. Open Ticket is actually the name of a mushroom buying practice. In the evening after returning from the woods, pickers sell their mushrooms for the buyer's price per pound. Adjusting in relation to the mushroom's size and maturity, it's great. Most wild mushrooms carry a st stable price. But the price of Matsutake shoots up and down. Within the night, the price may easily shift by $10 per pound or more. Within the season, price shifts are much greater. Between 2004 and 2008, prices shifted between $2 and $60 per pound for the best mushrooms. And this range is nothing compared with earlier years. Open ticket means that a picker may return to the buyer for the difference between the original price paid and a higher price offered on the same night. Buyers who earn a commission based on the poundage they offer, they buy, offer open ticket to entice pickers to sell early in the evening rather than waiting to see if prices will rise. 
An open ticket is testimony to the unspoken power of pickers to negotiate buying conditions. It also illustrates the strategies of buyers who continually try to put each other out of business. Open ticket is a practice of making and affirming freedom for both pickers and buyers. It seems an apt name for a side of freedom's performance. For what is exchanged every evening is not just mushrooms and money. Pickers, buyers, and field agents are engaged in dramatic enactments of freedom as they separately understand it and they exchange these encouraging each other along with their trophies, money, and mushrooms. Sometimes indeed, it seemed to me that the really important exchange was the freedom with the mushroom and money trophies ex extensions, proofs, as it were, of the performance. After all, it was the feeling of freedom galvanizing mushroom fever that energized buyers to put on their best shows and pressed pickers to get up the next dawn to search for mushrooms again. But what is this freedom about which pickers spoke? The more I asked about it, the more familiar it became to me. This is not the freedom imagined by economists, who use that term to talk about the regularities of the individual rational choice, nor is it political liberalism. This mushroom is freedom is irregular and outside rationalization. It is performative, finally varied, and effervescent. It has something to do with radical freedom emerges from an open-ended cultural interplay, full of potential conflict and misunderstanding. I think it exists only in relation to ghosts. Freedom is the negotiation of ghosts on a haunted landscape. It does not exercise the haunting, but works to survive and negotiate it with the flame. Open Ticket is haunted by many ghosts, not only the green ghosts of pickers who died in timely deaths, not only the Native American communities removed by U.S. laws and armies, not only the stumps of great trees cut down by reckless loggers never to be replaced, not only the haunting memories of war that will not seem to go away, but also the ghostly appearance of forms of power held in abeyance that enter the everyday work of picking and buying. Some kinds of power are there, but not there. This haunting is a place from which to begin to understand this multiply, culturally layered enactment of freedom. Consider these absences that make Open Ticket what it is. Open Ticket is far from the concentration of power. It is the opposite of a city. It is missing social order. As Sang, a Lao picker, put it, Buddha is not here. Pickers are selfish and greedy, he said. He was impatient to return to the temple where things were properly arranged. But meanwhile, Dara, their Khmer teenager, explained that this is the only place she can grow up away from the violence of gangs. Yet Thong is a former Lao gang member. I think he is getting away from warrants for his arrest. Open Ticket is a hodgepodge of flights from the city. White Vietnam vets told me they wanted to be away from crowds, which sparked flashbacks from the war and uncontrollable panic attacks. Mung and Min told me they were not they were disappointed in America, which had promised them freedom, but instead crowded them into tiny urban apartments. Only in the mountains could they find the freedom they remembered from Southeast Asia. Maine, in particular, hoped to reconstitu reconstitute a remembered village life in the Matsutake forest. Matsutake picking was a time to see dispersed friends and to be away from the constraints of a crowded families. Nai Tong, a main grandmother, explained that her daughter called her every day to beg her to come home to take care of the grandchildren, but she calmly repeated that she had at least to make up the money for her picking permit. She could not go back yet. The important bids were left unsaid in those calls. Escaping from apartment life, she had the freedom of the hills. The money was less important than the freedom. Matsutake picking is not the city, although haunted by it. Picking is also not labor or even work. Sai, a loud picker, explained that work means obeying your boss, doing what he tells you to. In contrast, Matsutake picking is searching. It is looking for your fortune, not doing your job. When a white campground, campground owner, sympathetic to the pickers, talked to me about how the pickers deserved more because they worked so hard, getting up at dawn and staying through sun and snow, something nagged at me about her view. I had never heard a picker talk like that. No pickers I met imagined the money they gained from Matsutake as a return on their labor. Even Nai Tong's time babysitting was more akin to work than mushroom picking. Tom, a white field agent who had spent years as a picker, was particularly clear about rejecting labor. He had been an employee of a big time timber company, but one day he put his equipment in his locker, walked out the door, and never looked back. 
He moved his family into the woods and earned from what the land would give him. He has gathered cones for sea companies and chopped beavers for skins. He had picked all kinds of mushrooms not to eat but to sell, and he has taken his skills into the buying scene. Tom tells me how liberals have ruined American society. Men no longer know how to be men. The best answer is to reject what liberals think of as standard employment. Tom goes to great lengths to explain to me that the buyers he works with are not employees, but independent businessmen. Even though he gives them a large amount of cash every day to buy mushrooms, they can sell to any field agent, and I know they do. It's all an all-cash business, too, without contracts. So if a buyer decides to abscond with his cash, he says there's nothing he can do about it. Amazingly, buyers who abscond often come back to deal with another field agent. <coughs> but the skills he lends buyers for weighing mushrooms, he points out, are his. He could call the police about the skills. He tells the story of a recent buyer who absconded with several thousand dollars, but made the mistake of taking the scale. Tom drove down the road in the direction he believed the buyer took, and sure enough, there was the scale abandoned by the side of the road. The cash was gone, of course, but that was the risk of independent business. Pickers bring many kinds of cultural heritage to the rejection of labor. Mad Jim celebrates his Native American ancestors at Matsutake picking. After many jobs, he said he was working as a bartender on the coast. A Native woman walked in with a $100 bill. Shocked, he asked where she got it. Picking mushrooms, she told him. Jim went out the next day. It wasn't easy to learn. He crawled through the brush. He followed animals. Now he knows how to stalk the dunes for the Matsutake buried deep in the sand. He knows where to look under tangled rhododendron roots in the mountains. Rhododendron. He has never gone back to wage work. Love's son works in a Walmart warehouse in California where he is not picking Matsutake, working 11.50 an hour. To get that pay rate, however, he had to agree to work without medical benefits. When he hurt his back on the job and was unable to lift merchandise, he was given a long leave to recover. Well, he hopes the company will take him back. He says he gets more money from Matsutake picking than from Walmart anyway, despite the fact that the mushroom season is only two months long. Besides, he and his wife look forward to joining the vibrant meme community and open ticket every year. They consider it a vacation. On weekends, their children and grandchildren sometimes come out to join them in picking. Matsutake picking is not labor, but it is haunted by labor. So too, property. Matsutake pickers act as if the forest was an extensive commons. The land is not officially a commons. It is mainly national raid, nas national forests, with some adjacent private lands, as fully protected by the state, but the pickers do their best to ignore questions of property. White pickers are particularly aggravated by federal property and do their best to throw restrictions on using it. Southeast Asian pickers are generally warmer to the government, expressing wishes that it would do more. Unlike white pickers, many of whom are proud of picking without a permit, most Southeast Asians register with the Forest Service for permission to pick. However, the fact that law enforcement tend, tends to single out Asians for infractions even without evidence, as one Khmer buyer put it, driving while being Asian makes it seem less worth the effort to stay within the law. Not many do. Vast lands without boundary markers make stayed, staying in approved picking zones quite difficult, as I found from my own experience. Once the sheriff staked out my car to catch me without a permit when I returned with mushrooms. Even as an avid reader of maps, I had been unable to tell him whether this place was on or off limits. One. When, buy, when pickers buy forest service picking permits, they are given maps that show picking and no picking zones. However, the zones are marked only in the abstract spaces. The maps show only major thoroughfares and no topography, railroads, small roads, or vegetation. It is almost impossible for even the most determined reader to make sense of the map on the ground. Besides, many pickers cannot read maps. One loud picker showed me a no picking zone on his map by indicating a lake. Some pickers use the maps as toilet paper, which is scarce in the campgrounds. I was lucky, I was just at the border, but it wasn't marked. Once, too, after I had pleaded with the Lao family for days to take me picking, they agreed. If I would drive, we chucked through forests on unmarked dirt roads for what seemed hours before they told me we had arrived at the place they wanted to pick. When I pulled over, they asked me why I wasn't trying to hide the car. Only then did I realize that we were surely trespassing. The fines are steep. 
During my field work, the fine for picking in a national park was $2,000 on the first offense. The law enforcement is thin on the ground, and the roads and trails are many. The national forests crisscross with abandoned logging roads. These make it possible for pickers to travel across extensive forest land. The young men, too, are willing to hike many miles, looking for the most isolated mushroom patches, perhaps on forbidden lands, perhaps not. When the mushrooms get to the buyers, no one asks. The regulation requires buyers to record the place where Matsutake are picked. However, I never saw such records being made. In other Matsutake buying areas, this regulation is enforced through pickers' self-statements. But what is public property, if not an oxymoron? Certainly, the Forest Services has trouble with it in these times. Reg legislation requires that public forests be thinned for fire protection for a square mile around private within holdings. This requires a lot of public funds to save a few private assets. This is fire protection mandated by the Industry Promoted Healthy Forest Restoration Act of 2003. Jacqueline Vaughn and Hannah Cordner, George W. Bush's Healthy Forests. Boulder University Press of Colorado, 2005. Meanwhile, private timber companies do that thinning, making further profits from public forests. And while logging is allowed within late successional reserves, what pickers are forbidden, because no one has found funds for an environmental impact assessment, the pickers have trouble sorting out which kinds of lands are off limits. They are not alone in their confusion. The difference between the two kinds of confusion, of confusion is also instructive. The Forest Service is asked to uphold property, even if it means neglecting the public. The pickers do their best to hold property in abeyance as they pursue a commons haunted by the possibility of their own exclusion. Freedom, haunting, two sides of the same experience, conjuring a future full of pasts. A ghost-ridden freedom is both a way to move on and a way to remember. In its fever, picking escapes the separation of persons and things so due to industrial produ production. The mushrooms are not yet alienated commodities. They are effects of the pickers' freedom. Yet this scene only exists because the two-sided experience has purchased in a strange sort of commerce. Buyers translate freedom trophies into trade through dramatic performances of free market competition. Thus market freedom enters freedoms as jungle, making the holding and abeyance of concentrated power, labor, property, and alienation seem strong and effective.